you sold uh, $175 million worth of real estate last year. To put that in perspective, my best year ever, that's about double my best year ever, man. All right, dude, 24 years old, you sold uh, $175 million worth of real estate last year. To put that in perspective, my best year ever, that's about double yeah. my best year ever, man. So first off, congrats, dude. Thank you. That puts you in the top, what, 50 teams in the country? Yeah, we finished, as we left, we finished number 14. So that's a number we're pretty proud of. It's pretty awesome. And when yeah. you say you left, when you mean when you left your old brokerage, Keller Williams. Yeah. Yep. So Keller Williams is the biggest company in the country now for, I don't know, a decade. And you were the number 14 team in the entire country. Yeah, definitely. It's freaking awesome, dude. So I, one thing that I like about you is, you know, people talk about, I think one of the mistakes that people make is they think it takes this giant thing or this giant, like, uh, effort to make changes in your life. And I don't think people truly understand how quickly you can change your situation to become remarkable if you truly choose to do it. I mean, you've been doing real estate for what? Three and a half years now? Yeah, three and a half, four years. So let's take it back to the beginning, dude. Teach us how you did this. Because you literally went from 21-year-old kid, yep. which most people, by the way, when they get into real estate and they're that young, all they can think of is, oh, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody that has any money. And they just kind of like kind of mosey around or they end up as an assistant or something like that because they can't figure out how to make definitely. anything happen. So what did you do, dude? You're 21 when you get into real estate. How'd you make it happen? Yeah, so definitely. So I came from a sports background. I got hurt in college and then I signed up for my real estate license the next day I had my real estate license uh, 31 days later after I took the test and it's just been organic growth since so I got in not really wanting knowing what I wanted to do with my life and so I got in with one of my best friends Mason and then my dad who's been it for 10 15 years and from that point it's been all in just rapid fire on the Utah market. So take us back to the beginning though. What did a day look like? Like you get in, I remember my first day, I go into the office, dude. And yeah. back then we didn't have Zillow. We didn't have marketing. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have all these ways where you could learn how to do real estate, right? Like nowadays there's so much information out there. Really, it's just a matter of people want to do it or not, but there's any idiot can figure out how to be yeah. a successful realtor. Yeah. Let's just be honest. Back when I started, dude, I literally walked into my brokerage the first day and I asked him like, all right, what do I do? And yeah. he looked at me like I was the first one to ever ask him the question. He's yeah. like, uh, start calling people. I'm like, well, who do I call? He's like, I yeah. don't know. And then pick up the phone book or whatever. And I remember, dude, I was trying to hit up all my parents, friends, and they were all just looking at me, this little idiot, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was rough at first. In my first six months, I think I sold like, I don't know, four or five houses. And it wasn't until I, you know, learned for sell by owners and, and some of those things where I really kind of started to take off. But take me back to the beginning for you. How did, when you first started, you know, how quickly did you figure out where you wanted to go with it? Yeah, so kind of same story for me. So I, I walked into the office, I asked for people to help me out and my dad gave me a piece of paper that had numbers to call from an old open house list. And so I think my MO was open house after open house after open house. I'd hold about 20 hours of open houses a week and then on Mondays I'd call them. And so that is how I think I did about the same four or five deals in my first six months. And it was an absolute grind of, hey, how do I get business? How do I get business? And then I started to get a little smarter at about month six. And that's when it really started to click for me. And so when you say you got a little bit smarter, what did you do that was different? Yeah, we just connected with the right people. So as someone from Zillow took us under their wing. And then I, we connected with a few people in our brokers that really helped us out. And so that definitely, we got, we got involved with Zillow to get leads. And then we started, that's when we started to form a team and we would share the pool of leads and just really create a consumer and on-demand experience for the consumer. I think a lot of people don't really understand how Zillow works or how they're profitable or how they make their money. I mean, I remember when Zillow first came out, I'd been a realtor for a couple of years yeah. and we were kind of like, wait, what is this service? And it was like back then, you know, as far as home values, they were way off. I think they're yeah. still pretty, they struggle a little bit with that, but they figured out so many things and kind of what they do is they become this lead generation source and they sell it back to the realtors. And so um, for a lot of, you know, agents like yourself, when you're new, it's perfect because you don't really know people. So if you can, you know, figure out the cost average per lead, Definitely. and then you figure out how many leads it takes to close one, you can see how much money you can make by yeah. just turning that machine on. Is that essentially what you? Yeah. So it was me, my one of my best friends, and then my dad. And as a total, we contributed fifteen hundred dollars. And at the time, that was about everything I had in my bank account. And we put it in monthly. And I was like, how am I going to afford to pay this? And then we got lead after lead, and then slowly increased the budget. And now. 
now we're here today spending 160,000 a month. So you still, I mean, you just, you're very young, obviously, yeah. and look very young. Yep. Um, when you first started out, was it hard to go meet with these people when you had, didn't know them, right? Did they ever like, look at you like, wait, this dude's going to help yeah. me. And I mean, <laughs> he looks like yeah. a kid. Yeah, totally. And no, I, I mean, I, I still get called a kid. And I, I think for me, it was, it was a chip on my shoulder, always has been. I got called a kid last weekend, but I think it definitely, I mean, I, my, my funniest comment, I was in an open house and she said, don't you have to be 18 to, to sell real estate? And I like, I didn't even know what to do at that point. And so I, I just laughed it off. And then it was another motivating piece for me. Mm. It's funny. Like when, um, I first got into real estate, I, I would go to all these conferences, these national conferences. And I felt like for a decade, I felt like yeah. I was like the youngest guy there. And, but it, there's a lot of advantages to being younger in real estate. I would just turn it and use it as an example. I'm like, well, yeah, but do you want an agent that's going to have to take care of his family and responsibilities with the neighborhood and the church and everything totally. else? Or do you want a dude that's available for 90 hours this week? Cause yeah. that's me. I'm yeah. available for 90 hours. I can yeah. do whatever you need. And, uh, I did have one experience. It was kind of funny. I had, I was calling for sell by owners and one of them was a guy in our neighborhood. Yeah. And he'd been, I had actually grown up with his son and I was probably 25. I was a couple of 26, I was a few years into real estate, but I just had been one of the two finalists for salesperson of the year on the Salt Lake Board of Realtors. So like I was one of the top agents in the in the state, you know, and, uh, and I called him this dude to sell for, uh, for sell by owner. And he, I remember his name and everything, but he goes, Oh, Jimmy, we're going to leave this up to the professionals. <laughs> I remember, yeah. like, I'm like, he just still was, saw me, this yeah, little yeah. idiot kid. And I'm like, well, you know, I was like, I kind of told him my, my numbers and stuff. He's like, Oh, that's, that's wow. That's really nice. Well, yeah, we just want somebody with a little more experience still. And I'm just like, what the hell? Like yeah. I realized very quickly, I was going to need to find my own leads and my yeah. neighbors and family friends that I grew up next to were never going to give me real estate. Yeah. yeah and I, I think for me, I, I still deal with the same issues and I, for people, I, I constantly, I, I myself, I finished in the top 50 in the state in Utah. I'll deal with that for the next 10 years. And so you can't convince people otherwise if they're stuck on that thinking. But I do think my age, people are attracted to. People mm -hmm. want to work with me because I will go out and hustle mm -hmm. for them. And like you said, I don't have kids. I have an amazing wife, but she lets me work at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock when in 5, 10 years when I have kids, that might not be the case. Well, it's cool. And it's, you know, you've proven with your track record, like once you have the track record, it's very rare you run into yeah. a problem, right? Like yeah. I remember this guy, he sold like luxury cars and he came home and I was meeting with his wife, trying to get her to sign the contract or whatever and to sell their house. And he's like, he's like, tried to like start ripping into me about questions. He was a sales guy. And he, after about two minutes, he goes, I don't need to know anything else. That's our guy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I was no. like, once you actually can speak yeah. the talk and you have the reputation and everything else. But so talk to me about scaling your team, because I personally have never scaled my team much. I've, you know, I have, there's like five or six of us on my team now, but we've never gone as big as you have. Yeah. Um, and you've done something, I mean, you have 53 agents that you manage now. Totally. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you manage to scale it and make sure everybody's, you know, happy and make sure everybody's getting enough leads and um, talk us, walk us through maybe a little bit of detail of, of how you've done that. Yeah. So I think it's constantly observing your organization. So I think we, we scaled from four agents to 13 agents in about a year and then COVID hit and we went from 13 agents to 53 agents. And so I think that's, that's in every night speaking with our leadership, with our agents, Hey, are we taking care of them? And if we're not, how can we solve that issue? But I think the number one thing that I constantly tell people, if you're going to scale, scale for a reason and know what the end goal is and why you're scaling. And I think if you constantly observe that, it comes pretty easy to you and you don't have a lot of headaches if you constantly pay attention to is everyone in your organization thriving like you want them to. Mm. So where'd you learn how to like run the business? Did you go to school for it? Or, I mean, cause you're, you're running, I mean, you're running a multi-million dollar business yeah. essentially at this point. Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm a college dropout today. I'm more proud of it now than I was four years ago, but it, I'm a learner. So I think I was surrounded by people in the beginning who perform at an elite level, Josh Stern, top Keller Williams team for years. Mm -hmm. I learn and learn and learn from people and that guy. And for me, it was just a constant like, Hey, who can I learn from? Who can I call? I mean, people like you, and that's why we connected. Like, I want to learn from you. You've mm -hmm. done what I haven't. And what can I pick up from you? So that's my, 
story it's your on secret. That. No, yeah. it's well, it's funny. It's I did the same thing. Like I just find people that are smarter than me. Totally. And you know, I was at a dinner last night, in fact, and one of my buddies walked up. It's a guy named Dan Young. You've probably seen him. He owns PC laptops. Bunch oh of, yeah. Guys yeah. worth just millions of millions, probably worth over a hundred million bucks yeah. at this point. I mean, the guy crushes life in every way. And it's so funny. He's like, kind of has that Jedi nerdy side of him, right? Totally. As a, any computer dude would. And I just freaking love the guy, but he shows up and we had 15 of us at this dinner. It was this dinner club thing that we've been doing. And he comes and he pulls up at his $250,000 Porsche, you know, and he gets out. He can't help himself. He just always wants to teach everybody. Yeah. And he's so good at it, but he gets out and he's talking about crypto and all these different things that he's doing. This guy's made a fortune in crypto. He's just crushed it. And I'm sitting there and there's like five or six of the people that were at the dinner. were kind of trying to get in on our conversation. And I go, guys, come over. You can listen. I said, this is why you surround yourself with people smarter than you. I said, totally. and it cost, you know, the dinner club that we did um it was a thousand bucks a person last night to be there we all paid a thousand bucks and we all went towards the yeah. this the the server it's and pretty I, incredible i well, watched it yeah it's pretty it's, awesome yeah. but i turned to the guys and i go that thousand dollars will be the best investment you ever made for the five minutes you're about to get with dan yeah. and he taught us like literally how to leverage your own crypto it's him and travis bot were the two guys that were sitting there and travis bot is another crypto multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. this guy made all his money in crypto and it's just crushes it he literally has the nicest house in utah valley in my opinion it's like my dream home and this dude, these two are sitting there talking crypto and we all just got to sit there and listen for like 15 minutes. Yeah. We're sitting in on this conversation. I'm like taking notes. I'm like setting appointments with them to talk later about following up with it. And I guarantee you, I'll make a hundred times what it costs to be at that dinner over the next year, just because I surrounded myself with those two dudes last night. Totally. So I, you know, I always tell people, you got to find ways to get in the room with people that you want to learn from. Yeah. I remember one of the best moves I ever made in real estate. So it's funny because you got in at a, a time where, I mean, you've probably sold, how many homes have you sold now over a million bucks, your team? We've sold probably 50. I mean, we've sold 10 this year. That's crazy, so, right? So it took me eight years, my eighth year to sell my first million dollar home. Like I couldn't get over that barrier. I had one that was like 750 and it was such a good day. And I, I mean, now last year, same last year, I think I did 15 deals over a million bucks, right? But it took me forever to get that first deal over a million dollars. And I just remember like, I, I made a decision. The way I got that first deal is I had a buddy call me, my buddy Aaron Wagner, and uh, he's a venture capitalist here in Utah. We've become one of my best friends at the time. We'd only known each other as competitors. He was a realtor. I was a realtor. We'd always run into each other at first sell by owner meetings. We'd be waiting for each other outside the door. But he was kind of getting out of the day-to-day -day real estate, getting into more venture capital. And he wanted to have somebody to give his leads to where he could still get a referral fee. And so he invited me to go out to the BYU-Nebraska game. I'll never forget. It was the game when Mitch Matthews caught the, oh, yeah, yeah. the, the Hail Mary. And he goes, hey, we're going. We're flying out. Flying out that morning. Flying back that night. It's a 1000 bucks a person. Dude, taking a private jet. And at the time, I didn't really have that much extra money. I was like, oh, man, that, yeah, it's going to yeah, sting yeah, a little bit, right? you know? But I remember thinking to myself, you know what? I need to be on that plane. I need to meet these people. I need to surround myself with people that can afford to pay a 1000 bucks for the day. And so I go, and on that plane, I met a guy. And anyways, long story short, I ended up sending this, selling this guy's house for $5 bucks, And I met him because I put myself in that atmosphere to meet that person. And so I always tell people, like, they're... When they're like, I want to up, you know, the people that I'm around. I want to, I want to get a better, you know, a better club, or I want to get a better group that I'm or a group of friends or whatever. I say you need to surround yourself with people that are doing or, or are where you want to be. And that's one of the cool things about, you know, like with EXP, we've both joined now. We have that opportunity. Like, like some of these guys that are in, you know, the people that help us recruit. There's a couple guys, Tom Daves and uh, Brent Goad and. Uh, and Don Yoakum, they've built these ginormous real estate companies. They're builders. These guys have done. And so for somebody like you who wants to build the biggest team and, and really be able to have that, like it's kind of like the perfect opportunity for me as well to learn how to create that. I'm like, man, I just want to be a part of this. I want to be able to learn from these other people that have gone before and done that. Every time I've done that, every time I've ponied up or I've made that tough decision to make that jump, it's always paid off. Yeah, and I, I think I can speak to that too. So I think our partnership with Zillow has really created a cool opportunity. And so I've been in the room with, I mean, 10 of the top 50 team leaders in the country. And so I think, just like you said, how can I get in that room? It's a constant approach of how can I be involved with people mm. who are just movers and shakers in the state, in the country. And so I think Zillow did for us, that for us. And I think we wanted, we wanted to be part of a brokerage to where movers and shakers in the same business as well so i think don and tom i mean jimmy like it's amazing to be around these people just a phone call away on hey i have an idea how can we execute it
Yeah. No, it's fun, man. It's, it's being in real estate now for 17 years. I just look like I look at if, when I was your age, it's kind of when I started, I started when I was 24. So I was literally your age. And I think about like, if I'd had this opportunity then, because I've spent the last, you know, I, when I was, so when I, in 2007, we opened the first Keller Williams office in Utah County and I invested $90,000 into that. I mean, it cost me 90 grand of my own money. That was like everything I had yeah, saved. Yeah, yeah. And I was like 10% owner of this office. And then we lose money, dude, our first three years. <laughs> we're losing money so it's like all this investment I'm trying to get wealth I'm trying to create wealth and all I'm doing is losing my money yeah and it was I remember thinking like it was really frustrating because I remember thinking like how does anyone ever get ahead like how do you ever get ahead I mean with Killer Williams there's this opportunity to build like this profit share but it's after all the money's been paid and that's why when I was approached with EXP I was like geez louise like because they don't have physical office they don't have all these expenses I used to see the books because I was one of the owners we'd have eighty ninety thousand dollars a month we had to pay before we ever got any revenue. And I was like, geez, like with EXP, you don't have that. And so the money truly trickles back to the agents. And I was looking at the opportunity. I'm like, gosh, if I'd have had this when I was 24, I can't imagine how much money I'd have coming in now. And that's honestly, like, you don't know this, but that's why I thought of you first. When I started recruiting, like, all right, who, I, who do I want to bring into EXP and build this thing with? And I'm like, A, Michael's a builder because he's got 50 plus agents yeah. in like a couple of years. But B, I was like, dude, if I was his age, like this would have been so easy to do and like such a no brainer to go build this. I'm like, I guarantee he'll see it. Um, and, and you know, and that was cool because that was when we kind of first sat down and started talking yeah. about it. Yeah, and I, I think that that's where the opportunity that I saw and I mean, it was quick. I, I've looked at brokerages for two, two and a half years and I think we made the jump in probably three, four weeks. And I think for me, it was just the opportunity it can provide me, my family, but like more than that, it provides an unbelievable opportunity for the agent. Mm -hmm. And there's not a brokerage that I know of in the state country world that provides opportunity for someone who's not at the tip of the top. And that's what EXP does. Yeah, no, it's very well said. It's like, even as an owner too, well, the cool thing about EXP too is you don't have the downside. Yeah. So like, I'll give you an example. When we opened our doors, dude, again, I'm 90 grand. I'd put all my savings into Keller yeah. Williams, right? And then we had, we lost 250 grand our first year. I won't go into why it was a thing with Keller Williams that anyway, long story short, we lose money our first year and they had a, what's called a capital call. This is my first investment I've ever made. I had no idea what a capital yeah. call is. I don't know if you do right now. You're probably smart. And I, I was, <laughs> bro, when you own a company and it goes negative, it needs money yeah. percentage wise, whatever you own, you have to come up with to keep the company going. Yeah. So they got to raise a hundred grand. I think it was 150 grand. I own 10%. So I had to come up with like 15 more grand yeah. of money. I did not have, I'm like thinking of, I'm like putting this on credit cards and stuff. Yeah. So we have this capital call to keep the company alive. We've been in business for like six months. We're already doing capital calls. And this is in 2008, dude. This is like at the That's down. Rough. This is the yep. roughest time. I'm telling you like every dollar mattered. I did make, I had turned my budget to like 3,500 a month to live off to try to survive. And I was still telling my assistant multiple times he needed to hold a check uh, because I wasn't going to be able to cash it yeah. if there was no money in the account. And so it was, it really hurt, but that's one of the cool things about not having to actually own the company. You get the upside of building the team and that without the downside of like, Hey, if something goes wrong, like, you know, capital call or whatever it might be, you end up becoming responsible for that. And so dude, it's just like the lessons I learned, it's kind of fun. Like I look back now and I don't regret any part of my path. It just is what it is, but it's like, I have all this experience now and I get to kind of do this again and kind of help. Like I met five of your team members today and freaking rad kids, oh, man. Yeah. They're kids. It's yeah. funny. We were trying to take a video and they kept giggling the whole damn time. I'm like, oh, this is funny. They're actually kids. Like, yeah. but it's so fun to like watch that and to be able to see like, they're so young, they're so hungry. They have so much opportunity ahead of them. And it's going to be cool to be able to play a role in those lives and how many lives they're all going to go infect um, and be able to help out by, you know, just being able to mentor and coach and train you guys yeah. and, and do whatever I can to help. Yeah, no, we're, we're super excited to partner with people like you, Dom, Tom, uh, Don, Tom. It's a, uh, you know, I think when you described us as kids, we are kids. I mean, we love what we do. We were playing yeah. basketball at an elementary school at 2.30 yesterday, and then I was in a suit a couple hours later. And so I think that's why we do so well. It's organic, and it's, it, it truly is a family to us now. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And you can tell that you guys are all like, you don't really care about each other. Well, let's talk about real estate in general, dude. It's a weird market right now. It's crazy. How many deals you got under contract? I got over 100 deals under contract, but a lot more new builds and stuff like that, a lot of like, 
deals out of the state. Yeah. But like in Utah, I think I got like 20 deals under contract and I feel like I'm crushing it because it's so hard to get a deal done right now. But yeah. how are you guys managing with this like craziness that is the real estate market? Yeah, no, it, it's absolutely crazy. So I think we have about 111 contracts right now. I think we have like 20 or so new builds. We work wow. in a highly residential resale area right now. And it's nuts. I, I think I'll just tell a story real quick. A home was listed at 1.95. Uh, last week it was off market that the 1.95 would have shattered the record. We ended up submitting 550, so 550,000 over 2.5 and we lost it. Wait, you, you offered 550,000 above the asking price Yep, and Cash. it was off the market. Yep. We were competing against one other offer. And I think that is the definition of what's happening to the Utah real estate market. So where does it go from here? What do you think? I think we keep going. I, I think I've spoke to spoke to some news networks to Zillow. I think the next two, three years, I think we'll be super bullish. I can't speak yeah. on five, 10 years, but I think we're in a good spot economically here. It's funny because I started doing videos in 2013 and 2015. I really was, I was almost weekly doing a video on my Facebook talking about the need to invest in real estate. Yeah. And I would get messages. People were like, dude, this thing's about to crash. It's going to go down. And what happened, you don't remember this because you're too young, yeah. but dude, when that thing crashed, you were probably 10 and 11 years oh, old. Oh yeah. That's insane, by the way. Um, <laughs> Dude, it was awful. It was the worst thing, but it's so different now. Like every single thing that caused it to crash before, yeah. like doesn't exist today. And maybe it'd be good to kind of go through a few of those things because I think you're right. I think we're going to have this bull run for two to three years. And I don't think, I don't think it's ever going to crash. I think it will level off. And you know, you never know. We live in a weird world where, you know, the president could give any kind of weird executive order and who yeah, knows yeah. what happens <laughs> next. But barring something crazy like that or some kind of weird coronavirus type thing. It's like we simply have a supply and demand issue and you can't build new houses for cheaper than what exists. So you're not going to get some kind of break on what new comes out. So at the end of the day, you simply with any product, if you have more people that want it than is available, the price is going to keep going up. And so like, you know, last time we had the downturn, dude, this is insane. Like I know you weren't in this market, yeah. People would buy homes. You didn't have to show that you had income. You just told them on the phone. Yeah. So you literally could have a buyer would call up and say they made 80 grand a year and they'd just be like, okay, great. You make 80 grand. And then from there, you essentially didn't have to prove that income. And then you would get nothing down. So you put zero down on the house and uh, you would get a loan that was basically an adjustable rate loan, which meant for the first two years, yeah. the rate would be like 4%. And then it would adjust to like seven and a half percent or six and a half percent. out. <laughs> Bro, it was insane. But the problem was, is like nobody could qualify when it was time to switch their loans because yeah. the programs had all switched. But do so anybody and everybody was buying homes, hoping that it would kind of like right now, not quite as crazy, but it was close. And so like, if you could buy something right now with nothing down, you're like, well, I'll just sell it in nine months. The market's going up 15%. I'm going to make an extra 50, hundred grand. So everybody was doing that. Yeah. But the problem was, is nobody was putting any money down. Now, if you're buying an investment property, you have to put 20% down. Yeah. That's one of the nice things about this. And that's one of the reasons why this market is not going to just collapse is because everybody's putting money down. And before you had, you'd have a neighborhood where the builder would have 20 empty houses that had sold to investors. They were trying to rent out. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, there's not enough houses for renters either. Like totally. I put a house up for rent pretty recently and it sold, you know, immediately had it rented out because there's just, there's nowhere to rent. There's nowhere to, to, to buy right now. And all these people are looking for new homes and nobody's selling, you know, nobody's needing to sell it because then you got to buy something else. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, man, it's interesting, but it's a hell of a time to be a real estate agent. I'll yeah. say that. No, it's fun. And I, I really think we're in a healthy spot here because I work with a ton of out of state buyers and from coastal markets, from New York to California, the Bay area, Seattle, and they're coming in with cash. But what's interesting, that's also bringing Utah money out to where I haven't really seen that a couple of years ago to now it's, I mean, it's a frenzy of out of state versus in state. We have a horrible housing shortage. And I think it's hard to argue against investing in Utah for the next couple of years. Yeah, no, I think it's well said. It's There's plenty of markets you can be like, eh, I don't yeah, know if I'd totally. want to invest there. But you look yeah. at Utah, it's got every single metric that you would want a place to have to yeah. invest in. Like. Even in the coronavirus, dude, we had the lowest unemployment, oh, yeah. right? Like people were still getting to work. People were still getting their job done. And so it's really like, it gives me a lot of assurance. Um, so let me ask you a question. I, so I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Next Wave of Influence in Real Estate. And it was written for people like you to kind of like newer getting in the business. Definitely. Here's some, it was young hustlers, millennials. Um, what's your generation called? You're not even a millennial. You're like below that. 
Zennial? What's 24? I don't know. Zennial? I haven't is heard that. that. Is? I don't know. <laughs> we should go buy the I dome. think I'm a millennial. All right, millennial. Know. Call it a young millennial or whatever. But I, the whole point of the book was to kind of help people that were in your age to kind of get started in real estate, essentially. And one of the questions that I asked people on it, and I'll ask you, I guess, um, I don't know the answer to this from you, but um, is I asked them to describe their own investing strategy and kind of tell me about their own portfolio and over half these agents had not bought their own real estate investments. So I got to ask you, are you buying real estate investments? I am. No, I, uh, I've looked at my parents and then the people around me. So right now I own two, I just closed on a flip today. Nice. So I'm, and I'm actively trying to buy everything I can. So I, I look back in 20, I think 2017 or 2018, I, I fought so hard to buy this house. I couldn't qualify. I couldn't find someone who would co-sign for me. It's and hilarious it, to hear that because you were only 22. Yeah, <laughs> 21. but it, it just pains me. I saw the house sold for 300,000 more than my offer was under contract uh, for. And so, yeah, I, I see the value. I think it's critical. I preach it to my friends, my, my team. And I, I think it's absolute necessary, especially being a real estate agent because the paychecks stop when you stop working. So how mm -hmm. can you sell yourself up for the future? Yeah. One thing that will happen with you that you don't even know yet. That's kind of cool is all of your friends that you're helping to buy real estate now. Cause like a lot of them probably wouldn't have got in the homes if they didn't, you weren't in real yeah. estate. Like that's what happened with me. A lot of my, I was pushing a lot of them, you know, in fact, I just put one under contract today. It was a mission companion of mine. And I think we put it under contract at 520, no 550. We put it under contract for. He bought it for two ten. Oh yeah. Back in the day, right? And on the phone call, he's like, "I would have never even owned this thing without me, without you." You know, I've yeah. like gone triple since I bought it, basically. And it was just cool because it's like you see how it's going to set up all these people, and all your friends will have the benefit of you working hard and being in real estate. Definitely. And that's kind of one of the fun things about being a realtor is you kind of grow with these people, and they grow with you. Yeah. I mean, you're just starting, dude. Twenty four years old. Yeah. No, and I, I agree with you. So I've been in it four years. And to be honest, every deal that I've closed on, I've, I've questioned, wow, is that like, is that overpriced? Is mm -hmm. that pushing the boundaries? And every house I've resold for them, they've made 50, 60, a couple have made a couple hundred thousand. I know. And so I think it's just look at history and real estate's a long, long-term game and just buy into it. Yeah. I have one rule in real estate that helps me stay out of trouble. This is what I always tell people. I say, if the market turns tomorrow and you're still glad you own the home, then you got a good place. Yeah. So right now, even those homes that like you were like, geez, is this like overpriced? You yeah. know, the thing is, is they, the rate was so low, the rate was so good that the payment was still going to be much cheaper than it would have been renting the same house. So you're like, well, no, they should buy it because if they have to rent the same house, they're going to be paying five, six, 800 bucks more per month for it. And so I remember last year when the pandemic first hit and I kind of, nobody knew what was going on. And I was helping an ex-girlfriend and her husband buy a house and I just care about her. She's just a beautiful human, right? That was the best time to buy. It, it was. Well, beginning. here's, so, and yeah. I didn't realize it was like a, about a two to three week yeah. period where everyone was like, what's going on? Yeah. I literally almost like, I swear it was like, it was, I was losing sleep at night because I'm like, do I need to tell her not to buy? Yeah. She was buying this house, but the seller was like nervous. They dropped their price 20 grand. Yep. And I was like, oh my That's gosh, I blessing. think she got it for like 310. And I was just sweating. I was like, oh, I just hope so bad she doesn't get in trouble with this yeah. thing, with this yeah, pandemic yeah. and everything. And I almost said something like, don't buy it, don't buy it, don't buy it. But I'm like, it's not my job. And she was so excited. They were going to fix it up, her and her husband. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to let her buy it. And dude, I bet it's worth 480. 500 oh, yeah. right now. Like she's just crushed it. It makes me so happy. Like, cause I damn near talked her out yeah. of it. And I realized I had to realize, and that was kind of, I re literally just said, I'm like, you know what? She's got to live somewhere. She's going to have to rent if she doesn't buy this. It's not my job. I don't know where the market's going. And so I just sold it. But I told good buddies yeah. that we were going to go in on some homes together and buy some investments. And I told them to wait and they just laugh now. You know, my buddy, Jake, he's like, remember when we waited for six months? Yeah. and went on? No, like, I, I did the same thing. I, I, I literally woke up one morning. I was like, Hey, I got to run you through the money scenario. Like w what's the background? Do you have parents who can help you out? Like if something happens to your job, I mean, we all thought the world was crashing. Yeah. So no, I, I went through that as well. But now that he ended up buying the house at 360, I think a year ago, I got the house anniversary reminder a week ago. And I, I mean, he could sell it for five plus. Right yeah. Now. So being 24, you're around a lot of younger people. Are people your generation frustrated with what's going on? Because I would, if I was 24 and I didn't have money, I didn't have homes and assets and stuff like, right? Like you look at Bitcoin, you look at the stock market, you look at real estate, they're all at all time highs. Like, what do you invest in? I'd be so frustrated. Like, how do you build well? So like, 
I mean, what have you seen from your buddies and people your age? Yeah, and I, I think the honest answer is how can you not be? Like, how can you, you have to understand their frustration? You, mm -hmm. when, when they say we're in a bubble, you have to have that conversation because it doesn't make sense to someone who's not in real estate. And so I think it's, it's hey, sitting them down, having a conversation, a game plan, and going over the history of real estate. When it goes up, it goes down a little, then it skyrockets up, and then it's, I mean, it repeats. So I think it's, it's sitting them down, having a hard conversation. Hey, I know this is tough, but what can we do to set you up so you can get one property that will turn into an investment property? And I think right now you're seeing a lot of people have to rely on others. I mean, down payment assistance, whether that's a program or 10,000 from a parent, that is a conversation that's being had right now. You do that a lot with a lot of your clients? Yeah, and I, I think the clients we're seeing in Utah are, are pretty, especially with Zillow, they're, they're pretty gun heavy. They want to go, but with friends, uh, we're sure. having that conversation of like, hey, how can we get you to the finish line? I know it's tough right now, but I, if you don't do it now, in three years, you might never have a shot realistically. Yeah. I remember a couple of years ago, somebody said like Salt Lake's going to turn into like San Francisco with the home pricing. And I remember like rolling my right? eyes, like there's no way. Yeah. And here we are, like yeah. it's coming, <laughs> it's been happening, but no, I, and I think to that point and like, I'm guilty of it. I never, I truly never believed in Salt Lake. Like I was 2017, mm -hmm. 2018, 2019. I'm like, why, like why are prices going up? And my, I used to have a thought like, oh, in 10, 15 years we'll be Denver, Portland. And I think you're quickly seeing, it's like, wait, why wouldn't we be Denver, Portland right now? We yeah. offer what they offer. Yeah, Utah's so, a special place, man. Yeah. It really is. Like, it's fun for me to, like, I got a buddy in town right now, my buddy Dan Fleischman. He's, this dude, like, runs LA. Yeah. And he's in town for, like, four days. And it's so funny to watch him just get so, he loves Utah. He's giddy about it. He's like, yeah. this place is, you know, but everyone that comes to visit has kind of a similar experience. Yeah. Um, I had, you know, buddies that come from Florida to go skiing and, you know, went up in a couple of weeks ago and, and another guy from Michigan. And people come here and they're just like, man, it's, place truly is amazing. Yeah. Well, dude, so, um, what do you worry about being younger? Like what, you know, I know when I was your age and you're kind of, it, the world has changed so much since that time, but like, what do you worry about? What's kind of the things that you, uh, or what pushes you to work hard that, you know, just to try to get ahead right now? Yeah. I think for me, it's, it's a constant, Hey, how can I provide opportunity for the people, for me and the people around me? And I think it's, I, I can't afford to be worried right now. And I think the only thing I'm focused on is just improving myself and then improving, improving others. And I don't mean that in like a cheesy motivational quote way. It's like, but I do think we have an unreal opportunity to capitalize right now. Yeah. And I think every, everyone around me, I'm trying to help them get to the next level so we can all be set for the next, I guess for life. So, yeah, I think it's like a gold rush right now. It really yeah. is. It's like a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's like, when does this happen where we have so much opportunity to, to really create wealth and things like that? Um, well, I mean, you have so many people that you bring onto your team. How do you decide? What are you looking for when you interview people? How do you know you got somebody good versus, you know, somebody you would turn away? Yeah, definitely. And I, for us, we run it like a D1 sports program. I mean, it's, we love athletes, we love military. And I think the, the biggest thing for me is, do you want to work? And we'll press you to find out if you want to work. And it, I think if, you're, if you come in asking, oh, how much money can I make? How many leads are you gonna provide me? We're not the right fit. Mm -hmm. and, and we know mm -hmm. real quick, but I think it's, hey, I see what you're doing. I believe in the model. We'll hire that person every day. And so give us an idea of what your organization looks like, like break it down. Like, so you, what, what is your technical role? Are you team leader? What is yeah, your yep, team leader? Team leader. Yep. And so break down your organization. I just want for anybody listening to this, whether it's in real estate or another, you know, business, I mean, the organizational part of it is everything. I sat down for dinner two nights ago, this, this girl I'm friends with, she is starting a business and she yeah. wanted me to invest in it. Yeah. Right. And bless her heart. Like she's actually amazing at what she does. She's a sales girl. Um, saleswoman, whatever. Yeah. She's younger. She's like 20, 24, 25. And, um, and she's pitching me this whole thing. And she starts talking to me about, she wants a partner. She wants, you know, an yeah. equity partner, all these different things. And, and I'm like, you just need an office manager. Like she totally. basically doesn't like doing all these different yeah. roles. I said, have you done an org chart yet? And she's like, well, what's that? And I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going to invest, but you know, like yeah, right? well, let's sit down and let's map this thing out. I'm yeah. like, here's kind of, you have to know exactly who you yeah. need in your business and what their role is. Yeah. 
and how you're going to take that. But how have you broken yours down? Like what's been the key to be able to build this so fast and scale? Yeah. And I, I think my honest answer, do not, don't be naive when you're building a business. So the honest, I didn't believe in org charts a year or two years ago. I thought, I thought it was stupid. I thought none of us needed roles, but I think that will bite you and that will bite you quick especially when you get big enough. So it's me and my dad and we lead the team and my friend, one of my best friends, Mason, who started it with us. Uh, so we started about three and a half years ago. We have a director of operations who you've met, Ashley. She's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. My brother, who's the chief tech guy for us. And then we have tra a transaction coordinator team. And so I, and then we have pod leaders within our team. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think four or five is enough people to lead 53 but I think four or five people is enough to lead another five people who can lead a group of 10 yeah, and I, I'm huge on on the org chart in organizing a business because like I I went through it I didn't believe in it and it bit me quick I wouldn't I would lose sleep and I think you need to give people roles so they can understand and thrive in the business in order to develop yeah. Do you have a, you have a desire to learn like very few people I've ever met, which is one of the most, I think, important things that a human can have yeah. for success. I, you know, curiosity, right? Yeah. Like that desire to just want more, to want to be better all the time. Um, what do you study? What are you funneling into your mind to get that mindset to keep sharp like that? I'm a, I'm an MLS junkie. And so I, I look at stats. I, I think I know stats better than anyone in Salt Lake. Mm. And I, I check the MLS which is the listing feed that realtors look at. No joke, probably 25 times a day. So solds, actives, backups, under contracts. Part of I wanna service my clients, but I wanna know why the market's changing. Mm -hmm. Like, why is it so chaotic? And I think it's just real estate trends, uh, Wall Street Journal, I'm just constantly, I love real estate. I think when you, when you understand real estate better, it comes easier, especially when you're young. And so I'll look into real estate every day. Awesome. And as far as like outside of real estate stuff, what do you read or what do you do to like, or do you listen to stuff? Are you a podcast guy? Are you a book guy? Yeah. Uh, po podcast books. I'm a Malcolm Gladwell guy. I lo absolutely love learning. And I, I just love, I love businesses that boom and why. Hmm. And so I think it's just a constantly developing myself. I love podcast and whether it's, whether it's daily news or or learning how to better myself. I mean, I'm up at 6 a.m. listening to podcasts. And are you a get up at 6 a.m. guy? I'm not. Like oh, people yeah. always, uh, people always talk about morning routines. I'm a night owl, right? Like yeah. I'm a networker, so I go out every night pretty yeah. much. And so for me, I'm not as much of a morning person. I have certain things I get done every morning totally. that are kind of like what gets me in the right frame of mind every day. Yeah. But I'm not like a 6 a.m. guy. I, I'm getting there like little by little. I yeah. keep doing that. But you, so you are, you get up every morning? Yeah. And, and I think it was by default. So I used to get up at 8 or 9 a.m. But I think when I'd wake up at 8 or 9, I'd wake up with texts from 53 agents. And I was like, I got to have my morning. I have to be prepared before I get blown up. Mm. And so, so that's why I wake up and have my mornings and then go from there. I think that's smart. I'm getting the right mindset. And then that's, I have the advantage. I think, you know, I just, I kind of have a rule. It's like before 11 AM, like, so Gary Keller, which, you know, obviously we both came from Keller Williams. One of my favorite things that he would have used to say is he would say is like, whatever you do before 11 AM will determine the value of your day. Totally. Like what, what you do before 11 o'clock. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I need to do it from like seven to, 11. I'm not getting up at nine, but yeah, I'm not yeah, getting yeah, up yeah, at yeah, six totally. either. You know what I mean? But it's funny because people are always like, man, you must have a powerful morning routine. And I'm like, eh. It's mostly consists of like, I mean, I do these certain things every morning, but it's like, I, some days I'm up at six, some I'm up at eight, you know, it just oh, yeah. kind of depends on how yeah. that goes. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not rigid with anything, but I, I do believe in, in having some sort of routine and whether that happens by, by default or planning, I think you need it to prepare for the day. Mm. So, I mean, a lot of young people are probably gonna listen to this just cause you're so young, it's gonna catch their attention. Yep. So like, what advice do you have a brand new agents, dude? Whether they're 21 like you were, 24 like you are now, or just under 30 where you're still way young in this business? Yeah, I, I think, so Lee Stern, she's another big Keller Williams name. She, uh, she gave me some of the best advice I ever heard. And so it was the next six months to a year are going to be hell, but they will set you for life if you do it the right way. And so I think it's accepting that the 
the one to two years in the beginning of real estate are going to be a grind. You cannot systematically get around it. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no lead source that can make it easier, no mentor. So it's the first year or two of just like being okay and being happy. Like, Hey, this is what life what looks like. I used like. to say is fall in love with the grind. Yeah. Right. There's a, there's a movie, the a league of their own and one of my all time favorite movie scenes. And what it is is when Tom Hanks character um, is the coach and Gina Davis is the star player. About halfway through the movie, she decides she's going home. She's packing her bags and she's leaving. And Tom Hanks' character, you know, Jimmy Dugan, he comes over and he's like, what, what, what are you doing? Yeah. She goes, I'm going home. Yeah. He's like, well, I don't get it. Why are you going home? And she looks at him and she goes, you know, it just got to be too hard. And Tom Hanks looks at her and he says, it's supposed to be hard. The hard is what makes it great. Definitely. And I loved that when I was new in the business, I would think about that all the time. I'm like, the reason why this is great is because it is hard. Definitely. Average people won't do this, you know, do today what, what nobody else is willing to do so that you can one day do what nobody else can do. Definitely. Right. And I, I always say like, they're like, Jimmy, who do you look up to? And I'm like me in my twenties, yeah, right? <laughs> in my twenties, I worked so hard, bro. Like I gave everything I had. Yeah. I didn't take a vacation for years. Like I literally gave. I always joke. I'm like, you won't see a picture of me at a party or in a, well, uh, in a bar, in a yeah. club on a, I mean, I, I took very short vacations because I was grinding. I was yeah. building this thing and it was so hard, but it's like my thirties have truly been like a dream. I've been able to do anything I wanted because, because of that work I put in, in my twenties. And so it's fun to watch you, you know, right in the middle of that, you're in the middle of that yeah. grind dude, and you're building something much bigger than I ever did, but it's just really fun to watch. It's fun to be a part. It's why, again, why I wanted to kind of help be a mentor, be somebody yeah. that could be in business with yeah. you and why you were literally my first call when I yeah. thought of EXP of who I wanted to come over. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And I think I've, I've also watched you. I think my, my second point to that is just constantly learn. And I think I followed mm -hmm. you for a year or two on social media. And it's like, you're putting yourself in the room of people who know more than you do. Always. And like, that's the most <laughs> important thing in life. And so I think for me, it's, it's grinding, 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 but also like be willing to learn mm -hmm. from people who have already felt, fallen on their face. Like you don't have to. Yeah. So I think those are my two points. Well, it's cool. It's like every book you read is, you know, a very wise humans, 90 years of experience or 40 years of experience or 60 years of experience in an eight hours, 10 hours, right? Like you get to take all that information and just soak it in, totally. in eight to 10 hours. That's why I, I love reading, listening to podcasts and doing these things. But well, dude, it's been fun, man. You, you're now, um, we kind of work together in a way, which is really fun being part of EXP here in Utah to blow this thing up. Um, for anybody listening, why did you switch over to EXP, man? We'll end it with that. I think our switch was just driven off opportunity. And I, I think I've said it a couple times uh, in between this podcast, but I looked for two years on a way to give the agents more value than what they had. Mm. And I, I mean, it was year after year, interview after interview. And I finally, when you came to me with this model, it made sense and it made sense quick. And it was a way for agents to make money because they're constantly networking compared to, oh, I ha how many houses can I sell on to the next sale? It's, yeah, we'll always be on to the next sale, but get paid while you network because that's worth money. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Well, exciting. It's going to be fun to visit this in a couple of years and, and see what we've built, man. Thanks again and Thank look you. forward to the good times. No, appreciate you. All right, my man.